Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And so as you can see, we're going to be discussing a topic that in some social circles uh, people might have very strong opinions of, but I'm going to be using um, the current scientific knowledge that we have to explain the mechanism of celiac disease, but then also gluten intolerance. Now, before we go any further, we need to have an understanding of what gluten is. Okay? Gluten is a real thing, okay? and it's found in wheat products. So wheat is a crop. Wheat is processed to a lot of other things, including bread and then really anything that comes from bread. right? And so those wheat products have this conglomerate of proteins. This whole thing right here is basically gluten. Okay? And it's composed of two parts. There's one called glutenin, and then another called gliadin, all right? So you can see here these black strings of proteins, they're strand-like proteins. These are called glutenins, okay? And just so you know, glutenin is a class of proteins, but they all kind of look like this. So those are glutenins. Then these red circular proteins, are not really circular, but at least here in the picture, these ones that are more globular in shape, these are called gliadins. Okay? And gluten itself is really just a conglomerate of both of these strung together in a fashion like this. And so when you eat something that has any wheat products in it, you have the potential of getting gluten. All right? Now, there are some things, including some hard liquors, that are wheat-based or beers. And while the chances of getting gluten from that are very low, there is some probability that there is gluten in those. And this basically right here is gluten. Now, what happens when we consume anything with gluten? Well, let's look at this picture right here, which is really where we're going to discuss the mechanism of celiac disease. Okay. So right here, uh, we have the wall of basically the small intestine. That's where most of this process is going to occur. So here's the wall of the small intestine. Up here at the top, this is the intestinal lumen. So this is basically the passageway for the food. So when you eat something and it goes down your esophagus, down through the stomach, through the small intestine, basically that big, that big tunnel that is your GI tract, that is the lumen. And this is specifically the lumen of the small intestine. Okay, here's the cells that make up the lining of the small intestine. Okay, most of them are simple columnar epithelial cells. And then on this side is the interstitium. And then somewhere down here would be the bloodstream. And so generally speaking, if you want to absorb a nutrient, it has to go from the intestinal lumen across these cells into the interstitium, and then it would eventually cross into the blood. But there's a lot of stuff here in the interstitium, or interstitial area, as we might call it, that we sometimes tend to neglect when we're talking about physiology or anatomy and physiology. And one of those functions that occurs in the interstitium is really a, an immunological barrier. So if something managed to get across this intestinal wall that you didn't want to get into the blood, you have immune cells in here that can potentially destroy it or they can mount an immune response. Okay? So there's immune cells in here that we'll talk about in just a minute that are just waiting in case something was to get across this intestinal wall that you didn't want getting across. Maybe you'd like it to continue on through the GI tract and eventually end up in the stool. All right? So. With celiac disease, again, somebody's going to consume gluten. Here's our gluten. We've got this strand-like protein, that's the glutenins, and then these globular red proteins are the gliadins. Okay? Now, this gluten conglomerate is going to be broken down by a series of enzymes, and these enzymes are just generally called proteases, or in some cases, peptidases. And again, we have proteases in the stomach, the main one being pepsin, and then in the small intestine, we have things like uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidases, um, enteropeptidases, all that kind of stuff. And they're basically going to bust up this conglomerate. And so you see here, we've removed some of those gliadin proteins okay, um, from these uh, glutenin strands. And then these gliadin proteins can be further broken down into smaller peptides. Okay? In some cases, they might be broken down into individual amino acids. But here we've got some peptides, let's say. Okay? And then maybe some of this actually does not get broken down, and so it'll just wind up going into the feces, okay, into the stool. But here we've got these small peptides that are derived from gliadins. Okay? That means these are ultimately derived from gluten, but specifically the gliadin part. Well, small peptides can, in some cases, cross through these 
uh, cells right here that make up the small intestinal wall. Normally we think of things like amino acids or just dipeptides or tripeptides crossing, and then these peptides right here from gliadin can cross across the small intestine wall from the lumen into the interstitium. Now again, normally we think of the things that cross here as just being free amino acids, dipeptides, or at the maximum, tripeptides. But for different reasons, sometimes larger peptides can actually cross across this intestinal wall and get into the interstitium. And that's really where the problem begins. So here we've got these gliadin peptides. Well, there's an enzyme here in the interstitium called transglutaminase. And we won't go into exactly what it does, but it basically chemically modifies components of these gliadin peptides, and now they're in a, a particular modified form right here. So I tried to shade them in a little bit of a different color, so you can tell that they've been modified by this enzyme, transglutaminase. Well, there's immune cells waiting in the interstitium. Remember, that's an immunological barrier. So if something manages to get across the intestinal wall that we don't want going further into the bloodstream, we have immune cells here that can take care of that potentially. Well, right here we have a macrophage or a dendritic cell. Okay, these are phagocytes, but also antigen-presenting cells. Okay, and so what this macrophage can do is it can phagocytize these gliadin peptides or modified gliadin peptides. That just means that they basically swallow them up, they eat them, and they break them down further. Now, if they do this with a protein, sometimes what they'll do is they'll actually take a fragment of that protein, and instead of breaking it down further, what they'll actually do is they'll take it and display it on a cell surface receptor. So let me pull this back a little bit so you can see. So here's a macrophage. Theoretically, it's already taken up one of these, and it phagocytized it, meaning it broke it down enzymatically, but it saved a little piece of it, and it's now displaying it on a cell surface receptor. And so what this indicates to any other cells, potentially, like this T cell over here, is it says, hey, here is a foreign particle that we don't want. In fact, we want to get rid of it, so we should mount an immune response against it. That's the gist of antigen presentation. So once the macrophage really digests that protein and then displays it on the cell surface receptor, then it can come over here and interact with this T cell. And this is a specific kind of T cell called a helper T cell, and its function is to initiate an immune response. Now the T cell will mount an immune response against anything that resembles this gliadin peptide. And theoretically, there's a lot more gliadin peptides and gluten-related compounds. And the way that this T cell initiates the immune response is in two ways. Um, one, it can activate B cells. B cells are another type of lymphocyte that when activated, they can start proliferating into plasma cells and they start making antibodies. Okay? So the T cell right here, helper T cell, is going to trigger the activation of the B cell into a plasma cell, basically through cytokines. Okay? We won't go into the specific ones here, but basically the B cell becomes activated, it can differentiate into a plasma cell, and it will start making specific antibodies against gliadin. And we might term these generally anti-gliadin antibodies. And so these antibodies will circulate around here, and if they come in contact with one of these gliadin proteins, they're going to stick it and mark it for destruction. Okay? That's really the function of those antibodies. Now one question we should ask, and this is not unheard of in physiology, can these anti-gliadin antibodies cause host cell damage? It's possible. That would be an autoimmune reaction, and that is not unheard of in physiology. So again, we should keep this in mind. However, the thing that is known is that the T cells, helper T cells that is, when they activate the immune response, again, they're releasing a bunch of cytokines, which are basically chemical signals that initiate an immune response, it triggers inflammation. And that inflammation is going to cause other immune cells to come to the area, and basically they're just going to start busting up all the stuff that's there, and the end result is really tissue damage. And so with celiac disease, if a person um, has already been sensitized to gluten, meaning that they have uh, the capacity for an immune response against gluten or its component parts like gliadin, that means they already have antibodies against it and they're all, these helper T cells are already sensitized against gliadin and gluten. And so if they eat it, this thing happens and they immediately get inflammation and more damage uh, 
of the GI tract. And that's really celiac disease. That's its mechanism. So if you were to look up a rigorous definition of celiac disease, it's really just an immunological allergic reaction to gluten or some part of gluten. And generally, it's going to be gliadin. In fact, if you look at any study that determines if, if people have celiac disease, they're actually going to be looking for production of antibodies against gliadin specifically. Okay? So that's celiac disease. Now, here's where kind of the, the triggering part might be for some people, or if you have a very strong opinions, uh, is that most people do not have celiac disease. Even people who claim that they can't have gluten the vast majority of them actually do not have clinical celiac disease. And by clinical celiac disease, we mean measurable significant increases in these antibodies against um, gliadin or some part of gluten. They don't have that, okay? But yet these people still report that they have gastrointestinal issues whenever they consume things with gluten. And so they opt for a gluten-free lifestyle, gluten-free diet, gluten-free this and that. And there's a lot of videos on YouTube, and I've seen a lot of them, that poke fun of this and say, well, it's not a thing. Okay? They don't have celiac disease, and that's true. The vast majority of these people do not have celiac disease. In fact, I've only met two people in my life that actually have celiac disease, true celiac disease. So what do they have? Well, the problem is, is that they, they don't have celiac disease, but they do have an intolerance to something else that typically comes with gluten. Okay? So again, when you think of Batman and Robin, okay, Batman and Robin are a package deal. Some things just come with other things, right? So if you're eating something with gluten, gluten is not the only ingredient in that product. I mean, you can look at the label on the product and there's gonna be a lot of other ingredients, some of which aren't even listed. And one of those things that's not really listed are what are called FODMAPs, okay? Generally, if somebody does not have celiac disease, but they have observable uh, problems associated with gluten-containing foods, most likely what they have is a FODMAP intolerance. And this does not involve the immune system. This actually involves intestinal bacteria. So what is a FODMAP? Well, a FODMAP is not gluten, but it tends to come in foods that have gluten. And also, it's found in some foods that do not have gluten. Some vegetables actually have a significant amount of FODMAPs in them. Okay? So a FODMAP is basically an acronym for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And this is a very large class of compounds, but the gist of this is they're all carbohydrates. And they're all carbohydrates that are fermentable by intestinal bacteria. Now, when we look at the celiac disease mechanism, this is mostly gonna be occurring in the small intestine. Whereas the FODMAPs, this issue is going to be more in the large intestine, in the colon, okay, in contrast to celiac disease. And so what happens is when somebody consumes a food that has gluten in it, it probably also has these FODMAPs, which I've abbreviated F, okay. Um, the gluten itself may cause no issues whatsoever. However, uh, the FODMAPs have two mechanisms. One, they're able to be picked up by these intestinal bacteria. So again, we're in the large intestine and particularly in the large intestine or the colon, as it's called, there's a lot of bacteria, gut flora. And these flora, these bacteria, can pick up these FODMAPs and metabolize them through fermentation. Now, if you've taken a microbiology class, you probably know that if there's fermentation, there's often gas production, okay? One of the things that people who have supposed gluten intolerance actually report is that they feel extremely bloated. They have all sorts of intestinal pain. And it, it's actually a very real thing, okay? The mechanism of that does not involve the immune system. It actually just involves gas production from these bacteria. So when the, these bacteria metabolize the FODMAPs via fermentation pathways, one of the byproducts is gas. And that gas will cause the walls of the large intestine to be stretched and tensed, okay? And that's gonna cause some pressure in there and it's gonna cause a lot of GI discomfort. A lot of people will experience flatulence, pain. Those are all things associated with this gas production. That's not the only thing though. There's another mechanism here that's also gonna cause this bloated feeling and even potentially diarrhea with the consumption of FODMAPs. And that's the fact that FODMAPs 
in contrast to a lot of other food products, exert a very high osmotic pressure. A very high osmotic pressure. That means they're attracted to water. So anywhere you put FODMAPs, water is going to be drawn towards them. Okay. Now again, a brief review here of our setup. Here's the wall of now the large intestine or the colon. Here's the lumen up here. This is in the GI tract up here, in the, in the tube of the large intestine. And down here's the interstitium as we saw before. Now remember, the colon's job is to absorb water. So there's really easy transit for water across this membrane. But if we put a lot of FODMAPs in here, what do you think happens if they have a high osmotic pressure? They're going to attract a lot of water. And so now, instead of the large intestine being able to absorb water from the lumen into the interstitium and then to the blood, the water's going to move the opposite direction. So water's going to be drawn from the interstitium here, ultimately into the intestinal lumen. Now the contents of your large intestine have a lot more water. And what condition does that cause when there's enough water in the large intestine? You get watery stool, also known as diarrhea. Okay? So that's the mechanism of FODMAP-associated GI issues. It's non-immunological as far as anyone knows. It's really just operating more or less based off of the bacteria that are present, and then also really just physics here. Water is going to move toward the higher osmotic pressure, which is provided by those FODMAPs. The confusion lies in the fact that a lot of foods that contain gluten also have FODMAPs. They tend to come together in a pair. Batman and Robin, Superman and Wonder Woman, they all come in a pair like that. There are foods, however, that don't have gluten. They're gluten-free, but still have FODMAPs. And a great example of that are some of the vegetables that I have listed on this little chart right here. Okay, And so in terms of those videos that are very satirical, where they poke fun of gluten intolerance, um, do I agree or disagree with those? Well, partially. Okay? I agree only with the perspective that, well, they're not actually intolerant to gluten. Okay? They don't have an allergy to gluten. They do not have celiac disease in its clinical form. Okay? But that doesn't mean that they don't have severe discomfort. Okay? And that discomfort, and this is where I disagree, is not mediated by gluten. It's rather mediated by these carbohydrates that are present in some of these foods that cause all sorts of gastrointestinal issues from the gas production, stretch of the walls of the, of the large intestine, which can cause pain, bloating, diarrhea, the list goes on. But FODMAP-associated GI issues and celiac disease are two very different things, but often confused. And I hope at this video lecture, I've explained and hopefully you understand the difference between those two things. Clinically very different, often confused. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.